like like uh I just recently got into Mill Meek. Real, really? You like Mill Meek? Or Meek Mill? Yeah, Meek Mill. Meek <laughs> Mill, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Meek Mill. <laughs> episode of Relationship Foods. Thank you again for tuning in and thank you to all of those who have been watching all of the episodes. Your comments, your likes, your shares have meant the world and I'm so excited that you guys tune in week after week to watch the show and if you're new, welcome. I hope that you're, you'll be back here again. And so we're going to get right into it. I am so excited, as always, I always say that, to have my special guest, Miss Diana. And so what happened was Miss Diana gets her hair cut by my wife, Chan, and I started talking to her about food and I knew that she had to be a guest on this show. So she is here today and I can't wait for you all to meet her. But she requested meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and cabbage, a whole meal. And so I made some cabbage a little earlier and I'm gonna to talk to you about how I did that. But I, what I'm gonna show you now is how to make the meatloaf and the mashed potatoes. And I'm gonna do a mini meatloaf and I'm actually gonna pour a little um, shallot um, garlic gravy on top of it. So we're gonna mix it up a little bit, but I'm gonna jump right in and show you how to do the meatloaf. So what I have here is I have a meatloaf mix. And so a meatloaf mix is pork, beef, and veal. Pork is ground pork, beef is ground beef, and veal is actually the meat of calves. I know baby cows, so sad, but it actually adds a different flavor to it and it really helps make this meatloaf really good. And so the key to a good meatloaf is you wanna season it and you don't wanna over mix it. You do not wanna over mix your meatloaf because if you over mix it, then you have a really tough, dense ball of meat and nobody, nobody wants that. And so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna break up the meat. And so I'm just gonna take a fork and I'm just gonna break it up. And that's just so we can um, get the process started. And I'm gonna toss it obviously, but I just wanna break it up so we have a nice broken up base to start with. And so now that that's broken up, not too much, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add milk. This is just whole milk. I'm gonna add it to some panko breadcrumbs. And what that's gonna do, first it's gonna rehydrate the breadcrumbs, but it's gonna help the meatloaf stay nice and moist because you don't, no one wants dry meatloaf. And so I'm just gonna take a spoon here and just mix it. I'm mixing. I'm mixing. I'm mixing. And just mix it. No one wants dry meatloaf. And so the milk and the breadcrumbs together just help it stay nice and moist. And so I'm just gonna toss it and drop some breadcrumbs here. And you can use regular breadcrumbs if you want to use regular breadcrumbs, but I think panko breadcrumbs, they're lighter. They're like, I think they're, they're the Japanese style of breadcrumbs and I just think that they work really well. And so I recommend panko. But you know, if you're you're making this and all you have in your pantry is, you know, regular breadcrumbs, by all means, don't, don't feel the need to, to go out and buy panko if you don't have it. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the vegetables. And so what I did is I just sauteed some onions, some onions, some bell peppers, and some garlic. And the key that I did for, thi for this is I made sure that there was beef bouillon powder in the mix. And so I sauteed the onions, sauteed the bell peppers, sauteed the garlic, and then I, and I added some granulated beef bouillon powder to the vegetables. And what that does is that adds a nice flavor. And because there's beef in this um, meatloaf mix, it's gonna complement it very well and uh, make sure that the vegetables in this are nice and seasoned. And so I'm just gonna this spoon and I'm just gonna add it. And some people, when they're making meatloaf, they don't pre-cook their onions. And you don't have to, but I don't want, I wanna make sure everything's cooked through. I don't want crunchy onions in the meatloaf. And so I saute it before. And that also gives me a chance to add some flavor. Like I said, the beef bouillon powder is in there. And so I think sauteing it makes a difference. And so I have that and then I'm gonna add some herbs. And so what I have here is some fresh thyme and sage. And sage, people think about sage and they think of it as like a Thanksgiving type uh, herb, but people often forget that sage can be used in every time of the year. And so I think sage goes really well with this meatloaf and so I'm gonna add it. And then after that, I'm gonna add some ketchup. This is just regular, regular regular ketchup. There's nothing special about it. And um, after that, whoop, I got some ketchup. Gotta make sure you get all the ketchup. And after that, I'm gonna add some Worcestershire sauce. Um, and to be honest with you, meatloaf is actually not my, like growing up was not my favorite thing. I just like meat in a loaf, I, I don't really know about that. But you know, 
it's growing on me in some ways. And because Miss Diana wants it, I have to give Miss Diana what she wants. And so I'm making meatloaf. Um, and so I have all of this integrated, all of this in the bowl rather. And now I'm gonna add the breadcrumbs to this. And then after that, I'm gonna add the thing that's gonna help us bind together. I'm making a mess here. I'm gonna add the egg. And so this is just one regular egg and you just wanna beat it. I have my little whisk here. I love this little whisk. I highly recommend if you can buy, find a baby whisk, get a baby whisk. It's just, and if you're cooking with your kids, you can give them the baby whisk and they can do this step and it will be nice and fun for them. And so I'm just gonna add that. And that's what's gonna help this meatloaf bind together because you don't want the meatloaf falling apart because then it's just crumbled meat and it's not in a loaf. And so then I'm just gonna take the fork and that's really what's gonna allow us to make sure that the meatloaf is not too tough. I'm just gonna take the fork and do it. I'm not gonna use my hands because I don't wanna overwork it. I just wanna make sure it gets nice and integrated. And then, oh, I forgot the most important step. You gotta season it. You gotta season your meat. And so I'm just gonna do some seasoned salt. And because I have the beef bouillon powder in there, I'm not going to do a lot of this. And also because I'm gonna make a gravy that's gonna go on top, I also don't have to do a lot of salt because some flavor is gonna happen there. But I'm gonna make sure that there's some flavor in here because you know, if you miss the flavoring, then you've, you've already lost the battle because no one wants fan food. And that relationship foods, you do not do fan food. So I'm gonna add some pack black pepper and if you can buy if you can get freshly cracked black pepper i highly recommend it i know you can buy the already ground but i think the freshly cracked black pepper adds a nice touch and it's fresh and if you can use fresh ingredients you should use fresh ingredients i'm going to add some paprika to this this is my usual if you watch relationship foods you know this is my usual mix i can't believe i almost forgot to season the meatloaf that would not have been good because once you cook your meatloaf, there's really, like, I, like I'm gonna do the gravy, which would have saved it a little bit, but you know, the meat is still the meat, and so you wanna make sure the meat is seasoned. And then I'm gonna add some ground onion as well. Even though I have onions already in there, and even though I have garlic already in there, I'm adding the ground onion powder and the ground garlic powder because, you know, I have to have it. It just adds something. And then I'm gonna add some dried parsley flakes to it as well. And you know what, I'm eyeing this pantry over here and I see some hot sauce. I'm gonna add a little hot sauce because you know, hot sauce makes everything better. Just a little, not a lot, just a few dashes. Okay, there we go. Now we're ready. Almost, almost it was almost a disaster there. I'm sure she would have tasted it. like, oh, this is nice, but it needs some flavor. So I'm glad that I remembered that. But this looks great. It looks nice and integrated and it's not over mixing the fork, like I said, it, the fork makes it makes you, allows you to make sure, tongue twister, that you don't overwork it, your meat. Because you don't want to overwork it. And you could do this like a regular meatloaf. You could just put this all in one in one pan. But I like the mini meatloaf because it makes everyone feel special. They get their own little loaf. And and also to me, it allows it to cook faster. Because if you have a regular loaf, it's gonna take around 45 to 50 minutes. But with these mini loaves, maybe around 30 minutes, 25. And I just think they're really cute. And so I, anytime I get the chance to make something in a mini version, I go for it. That's why when I, if you saw the episode with the kids, I made the mac and cheese in the little mini Dutch ovens. I just, I love those things. And so this looks great. And so I'm just gonna show you how to mix this and then we're gonna pop it in the oven and then I'm gonna come back and show you how to make the mashed potatoes. But for now, we're gonna get this together. Okay, this looks good. And so this is when you just, now that you've mixed it, this is the point where you just gotta get your hands in there. You gotta get your hands dirty because you gotta form it. And you can't form it with the fork. So you're just gonna take a little bit and you're not gonna, you don't wanna pack it down. Like I don't wanna mush this together. I wanna keep it nice and light. And you kinda wanna eyeball this. Like it depends on how big you want your loaves. I, mm, I like this. This is a little cute little loaf. Not too big, not too small. Just like, like maybe like that. And everyone likes, you know, you don't want to look like a a, a, um, a a hamburger. You want it to look like a loaf. So you kind of want to form it. But like, you know, that's basically all you need to do. And then there you go. That's your mini meatloaf. And so I'm just going to put this on a, on a tray. And what I did is I put down some foil and I just sprayed it with some non-cook, uh, non-cook, um, non-stick cooking spray. That's what it is. 
all the tongue twisters today. But then you're just gonna keep doing this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep forming these little loaves. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop in the oven at 350 degrees and I'm gonna get them cooking. And while they're cooking, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show you how to make my mashed potatoes. And then we're gonna um, put everything together and I'll tell you how I made the cabbage as well. But we're gonna put everything together and Miss Diana is gonna be here and we're gonna talk. So I can't wait for her to get here, but I'll see you guys in a little bit. Hey, welcome back everyone. The mashed potatoes, well, the meatloaf, is in the oven and so now we are ready to start making the mashed potatoes and so what I have here is I have potatoes that I have already boiled now the key to making sure that your mashed potatoes are good is that you want to start the seasoning process with the potatoes boiling do not just take your potatoes and just put them in plain water and expect it to be good because this is your opportunity to season the potatoes themselves. Obviously, we're gonna mix, mix it together with the milk and with the butter and with other seasonings, but when you actually season the potato itself, it gets you off to a great start. And so what I did is I took the potatoes, they're Yukon Gold Potatoes, I diced them, put them in cold water, added extra virgin olive oil. You wanna make sure you get a good extra virgin olive oil because it will add, add flavor to it. And then I added some thyme, some garlic, some salt, some black pepper, and some garlic powder to the water. And so as it's boiling, it's absor absorbing that flavor and giving you a good start for your mashed potatoes. And after that, you just drain it and I've just mashed it. You can see I have this big giant masher here. Um, and I mashed them and so now we're ready to start putting it together. And so what I have here is I have some regular butter that I will, actually it's not regular butter. This is Kerrygold butter, which someone I heard described as the Beyonce of butters. And it actually is the Beyonce of butters. It is a very good butter. It's a little bit expensive for two sticks is about like $6, but let me tell you, it is absolutely worth it. So I have some Kerrygold butter and just some heavy cream. And you could use half and half if you wanna be a little bit healthier, or you could use whole milk or 2% milk. But today we're gonna indulge a little bit. And so I just use heavy cream. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some to it. And I'm not gonna add all of it because I wanna see what the consistency is gonna be. And then if it's a still a little bit thick, I'll add more. But you never wanna add all of it because you may end up with watery potatoes and no one no one wants that. And so I'm just gonna add a little and I'm gonna start mixing it. And for mashed potatoes, there are various different things that you can do with it. Some people actually like to bake their mashed potatoes. And so what you could do is, ooh, I'm making a mess. You could, um, you could take this, once you've made it, you could put it in a dish and you could top it with cheese. You could put bacon bits on top of it and make like a loaded mashed potato. There's various different things you can do. Um, but today we're just gonna do a regular, well, it's not a regular, but we're doing a variation of a regular classic mashed potatoes. And so this, I'm gonna add a little bit more, but I'm gonna start adding the seasonings and then add a little bit more of the heavy cream. And so what I have here is I have some Parmesan. Now Parmesan, it's like you could use regular cheddar, but I think for mashed potatoes, Parmesan adds a nice, uh, it's like a saltiness, but it adds like, um, like that, like a nice cheesiness to it without having the over overpowering flavor of cheddar or the color rather because we want them to be white mashed potatoes and if you start adding cheddar cheese you can use a white cheddar cheese but if you start adding yellow cheese it will get a little bit yellow plus i love parmesan so it's my cheese of choice but again you know you can do you here at relationship foods we always think that food is a process and recipes are suggestions and so if you have a favorite cheese that you like feel free to add that cheese and so i'm just going to add that here and then after that, I'm gonna add some herbs. And so I have some rosemary here, and I'm not gonna add thyme. I was gonna say I was gonna add thyme, but I added thyme to the boiled water. And so because there's already thyme flavor in the potatoes, I didn't think we needed to add any more. But if you're a really big fan of thyme, feel free to add more of that. But I'm just gonna get that stirring. You can already smell it. Like I said, rosemary is one of my favorite fragrances. So I can I add it every chance I can get. And then after that, I'm gonna add the secret to the best mashed potatoes, and that is roasted garlic. And so what you do with roasted garlic is you just take the head of garlic, the entire head of garlic, and you could do garlic cloves if you want, but I think it's easier just to roast the whole thing. And so you take the head of garlic and you chop off the top of it, you drizzle it with olive oil and some cracked black pepper, you fold it in foil and you put it in the oven at 475 or 500 degrees, on whatever the highest setting your oven has, and you bake it for about 10, 15 minutes. And it, you got to check it periodically, maybe a little bit longer. What that does is that brings out the sweet flavor of garlic. Like people know garlic as this pungent, strong flavor, but when you roast it, you bring out the natural sweetness and the sugars in the garlic, and it just gives it a nice, sweet garlic flavor. Like you still get the garlic, but it, it's a little less pungent and it's more fragrant and more sweet, and it really, add something and they mash right up when you put in the mashed potatoes and so people may not even know that they're there but when you taste roasted garlic mashed potatoes and then you taste regular potatoes you can tell 
you can tell the difference. So I highly encourage you to do it. And obviously if you're pressed for time, you don't have time to roast it, um, that's okay. But what you can do is you can roast garlic ahead of time because some people just spread it on like bread and eat it. Some people just eat them by themselves. And so you can always have roasted garlic on hand for whatever you're doing. And you can add it to, if you're making like a focaccia bread and you wanna add roasted garlic to that, it's really good. And so there's, you can do it breads, you can add it to sauces, you can add it to meats. There's so many different uses for roasted garlic. So in some ways, everything that you would add regular garlic to, you can pretty much add roasted garlic to it. Obviously, if it's um, something that requires like chopped raw garlic, then maybe not. But for some things when you're cooking it, that roasted garlic will do just fine. And so this is looking good, it's a little bit thick, so I'm gonna add a little bit more of the heavy cream and the butter. Not too much, again, you wanna make sure that you add a little mix, because I think sometimes when we're cooking, we can get a little bit excited, we wanna add everything, but a lot of cooking is just being patient and waiting and adding something, tasting it, or adding something, mixing it, seeing what it needs. Because you can never, there's a lot of things in cooking where you can never reverse, you can never go backwards. Like if you add too much salt, there's, you could try and save it, you could add sugar, but it's hard to go backwards. But when you add a little bit of salt, taste it, and then you can go forward. It's easier to go forward in cooking than it is to go backward because once you've made a mistake or if you burn something, it, sometimes it's, it's hard to return from that. But when you take your time, it allows you to control the process. And I think a lot of people when they're cooking, they get intimidated because it's like, I don't know what to do. I've never made this before. But just take your time. You should, if that's, I think that's the biggest thing in cooking is taking your time. And there's this really famous chef in New Orleans called Leah Chase, and she talked about how um, when you're cooking, you have to you have to love the pot that you're cooking. You have to invest love into it. Like if you're trying to do something in 25 minutes, then you should might as well just like heat a bowl of ramen. Like she really thought like if you're gonna make something, you gotta add love to it. You have to let it. You have, to, you have to actually insert love into the food you're cooking and that takes time. And so I think that's the biggest advice I can give you. When you're cooking, just take your time, don't rush. Because obviously if you're hungry, then maybe you need to get a snack before you start cooking. But I would encourage you to give yourself as much time as you can to cook. And obviously if you're busy and you're working, you don't have as much time, that's okay. But if you do have the chance to give yourself the time, give yourself the time. And so this looks good. I'm gonna add the rest of this cheese, because why not? And I'm gonna start adding the seasonings. And so I'm gonna do just seasoned salt. You know, at Relationship Foods, we love the seasoned salt because you know, why have salt when you can have salt that's seasoned? So um, I'm gonna add a little bit of garlic powder, even though I have the roasted garlic, again, garlic powder adds a good flavor to it. And again, we're gonna taste this. You can adjust it. And, and because we have a, there's a gravy that's gonna go with the meatloaf. You don't, you don't have to salt it too much because you don't wanna to add too much salt, but you do wanna make sure that this is flavored and it's not just a regular bland mashed potato. So I'm gonna add some cracked black pepper. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of paprika. And you can use any type of paprika you want. This is just a regular, sometimes I do the smoked paprika or the sweet Hungarian paprika, but this is just a, just a regular paprika. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get this mixing and I'm gonna taste it and adjust the seasoning like I always have to do. And when we come back, I'm gonna show you how to make the sauce for the meatloaf and then we're gonna put it all together. And I'm gonna sit down and talk with Miss Diana and I cannot wait to talk to her about her relationship to food and for her to try the food. And so I hope you'll stay tuned for the next part. To it and it's getting nice and fragrant and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the process of making the gravy and for that you need flour and so this is just regular all-purpose flour and I'm just going to eyeball it you can I feel like I don't I don't measure things I just like eyeball it and I feel like when you when you cook over time you start to learn like oh that's about enough um, but if you wanted to get the actual measurements you can just go online and find a, a recipe for gravy and it'll tell you kind of like the ratio of how much flour you would need but I just I just look at it and say, oh, maybe it needs a little bit more. And I'm looking at it and it does need a little bit more. 
And this is what allows it to get thick because if you guys watch the episode with the kids when I made the mac and cheese, I made a roux for the sauce. And that's exactly what we're doing here. The butter in there and the flour is what makes the roux for this gravy and it's gonna allow it to get nice and thick. And remember, if you watch the episode, you will remember that I also said that you have to cook the flour. You do not want to have, like just do the flour and then throw the stock in there. You wanna make sure that you give the flour a chance to cook so you don't have that raw flour taste in your gravy. This looks good. I'm gonna add a little bit more. And then it's, this is pretty simple. It's not like a really complicated sauce. And I'm just gonna add just some beef stock and just let it reduce and then taste it. One thing that you could do if you wanted to try something different, you could add a can of mushroom soup to this. Um, for today, I'm not gonna do it. But if you wanted to, that would also be a nice addition to this sauce. And so this is it's looking pretty good. And this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna add beef stock. This is just a regular beef stock. You could do um, beef broth if you wanted to, um, but for this case, I'm using stock. And if you don't have stock on hand, of course, what you could do, you could do water and then just add a beef uh, bouillon cube or two to it, and that would get the job done just as well for the most part. And so now I'm just gonna add, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna start to get thick. I'm just gonna add a little and I'm gonna stir it because you don't wanna, you wanna make sure there's no clumps and it gets nice and integrated. And I'm just gonna add a little bit more. And you just eyeball it. And that looks a lot good. So what happens is I'm just gonna let this get thick and um, let it reduce a little bit, let it do its thing. And then after I'm just gonna come back to show you the final step, which is just plating. And then we're gonna sit down and talk. So I hope you stay tuned for the final part before our conversation. So the sauce is all thickened and I seasoned it, tasted it, and so we're all set to plate. So as you see, I have the meatloaf here, I have the cabbage, and for the cabbage, what I did, all I did was um, I took some bacon, I sauteed it, then I added some garlic, some bell pepper, some onion, let that get nice and integrated in the bacon fat, and then I added the cabbage and a little bit of water, covered it, let it reduce, and get all nice and soft, but not too soft. You don't wanna overcook your cabbage. You wanna make sure it has a little bit of a crunch and it's not too mushy. And then when it was almost done, I seasoned it. And I just did the seasoned salt, the garlic powder, the onion powder, um, and the black pepper. And then it was all set. And I added, oh, I almost forgot the most important part, a little bit of sugar. And I feel like when you're doing green vegetables, and if you, if you're, if you have family that comes from the South, you know about putting sugar in green mm -hmm. vegetables, but you wanna put a little bit of sugar just to, counteract the bitterness of green vegetables. And so I added a little bit of sugar. And as you can see, it's all there. And so all we're gonna do now is plate it. And then that's our final step. So I'm just gonna take the gravy and I'm just gonna pour it over the meatloaf. And that's it. And so I am so excited um, for Miss Diana to try it and for us to sit down and have a conversation. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that. So I am so excited to have Miss Diana here with me. Thank you so much for coming to Relationship Foods. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course, yes, absolutely. So we're gonna dig right into it. So at really Relationship Foods, we believe that first bites are like first loves. You never forget them. And so I just want you to take a moment to you know, close your eyes and try the food and tell me what comes to mind. Close my eyes? You don't have to close your eyes, but you know, just take a moment to just try everything and the meatloaf, the mashed potatoes, and tell me what you think. It's good. And we can talk all about like why meatloaf is your favorite, your favorite thing. It was very good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, I like it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you do. So, um, why is meatloaf your favorite? I have no idea. Thing? What is it about meatloaf that just excites well, you? Well, I like ground beef. Anything mm -hmm. with ground beef, I love. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I just love meatloaf. You just love meatloaf. And you always did, even as a kid, you love meatloaf? Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. And so who, when growing up, who made the best meatloaf for you? Well, mostly when I was growing up, I come from old-fashioned parents. Okay. You did not eat at anybody else's house. <laughs> you just ate at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or sometime maybe 
my aunt. Mm -hmm. But my father was a stripper. When you go to the south, they ask you, do you want something to eat? You say no. You say no. But a lot of times I got in a lot of trouble. Because you would eat other mm -hmm. people's so like You would say, okay, okay. But most of the time, oh, this meatloaf is good. Oh, thank you. Most of the time, it was at my mom's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, I think it was still at my mom's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's just something about meatloaf I love. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is really good. Oh, thank you, thank you. So growing up. It's different. <laughs> it's <good. laughs> you know, thank you. I'm so glad that you like it. So growing up, what is like, what are food memories that you have from growing up? Like things like favorite dishes, things like gatherings you would have that were around foods. Like just growing up, what was food in your house like? Homemade biscuits. Oh, wow. And on the weekend, homemade rolls. Homemade rolls. Oh, that sounds, that sounds Fried good. fish mm -hmm. or biscuits with fried chicken on mm -hmm. the weekend. Yeah. Of something that my parents used to cook called brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. Okay. But basically, mm -hmm. the homemade rolls or the homemade biscuits. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you. And fried chicken. Fried chicken. And who would make the best fried chicken at home? My mother's sister. Mm -hmm. Aunt Rebecca would make chicken. You could smell all the way down the block. Oh, wow. Delicious. Wow. Mm hmm. Yeah. It was good chicken. Mm hmm. Okay, and so in growing up in your house, was your mom the one who cooks, or did your dad cook at all, or like who was the primary cook? My mother was the only cook. The only cook. <laughs> no one else cooked. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she was the only one that did anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I grew up, I wasn't taught to cook. I wasn't allowed to be in the kitchen, so I didn't know how to cook. Oh, really? Why weren't you allowed to be in the kitchen? I was the only child. I was spoiled. <laughs> so you didn't have to? You never had any interest in doing it? Are you kidding? <laughs> no. And when I got married, it was a total disaster because I didn't have to cook anything. <laughs> so did you have to, so did your husband cook or? No, and he was not happy with me for a long time. <laughs> really? Because you didn't cook? Because I didn't know how he, I only knew how to fry chicken, mm -hmm. make mashed potatoes, and open the can of peas. And after a whole week of that, we're not even going in. <laughs> So, so growing up, so it seems like growing up, you were just, you were the one who ate the food. Everyone cooked it and you just got to enjoy all of it. I just ate it. Mm -hmm. You just ate it. That, that's not a bad deal though. I feel like you, you get a lot of I didn't think food. it was a bad deal <laughs> until I got married. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like as you, like you became an adult, you got older, like how did your relationship to food change? Like when you were younger, like what did you like about food? And as you got older, what did you start to like about food that was like different? I think. Growing up, I always liked food. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I started to love food. Mm -hmm. And still love food, but I tried to maintain my weight for a while, but mm -hmm. all my life has been up and down, up and down, and mostly mm -hmm. a losing battle, because mm -hmm. I like food. Yeah, yeah. And I, as I start cooking for myself, I cook food that I like. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I would get greedy Mm -hmm. And eat too much of it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes but sense. I love food. Yeah, yeah. I love this meat. Oh, thank you, thank you. You notice I'm not eating any meat. <laughs> meat. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what is your like? Is food an emotional relationship? Do you have like an emotional relationship to food? Like, do you eat when you're sad? Do you eat when you're happy? I eat whatever the mood strikes. Whatever the mood. <laughs> That's just food is just always there. Food is always there. I wouldn't say I was an emotional. Cause if I'm really, really sad, I'll snack. You'll snack. You won't. But if I'm mm -hmm. happy, I want a good meal. You want a good meal, mm -hmm. like a solid, mm -hmm. like a solid meal. Okay. And so, remind me, where are you originally from? I was born in Yankees, New York, but I okay. was raised in New, New Jersey. Okay. And so, does your family have? I, I, does your family have like roots in the South? Mm -hmm. Virginia. Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. My family has roots in Alabama. Oh, in Tennessee okay. and the yeah. potato state, you might as well say, because we eat potatoes every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, what is your favorite type of food? Is it soul food? Is it Asian food? Like, what is the food that you can just eat all the time? Soul food. Soul food. Yeah, yeah. What 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 type of soul food? Like, is it fried? Is it the fried chicken? Is no, it that's like a smothered pork chop. The smothered pork chops. Mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. macaroni and cheese, mm -hmm. and cabbage. Any way you cook the cabbage, mm -hmm. except overcooked. Overcooked, yes. Yeah, My you know. mother could not cook cabbage. <laughs> Yeah, and so if, so is it that like the things that your mother wasn't good at cooking, you would like 
get it from your other family members and they would cook it better? Mm-mm. Or like just, I said, my father did not oh, clean. Didn't. You don't eat at nobody else's house because you don't know if they clean. Mm-hmm. You ate at home. Mm-hmm. You only so as a child, I hated cabbage. Oh, really? Because okay. she would overcook it. It would be pink and whistle. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. as I got older and went around my other relatives, I said, your cabbage not mushy. Mm-hmm. And then I got to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So I like it fried. I like it boiled, stupid. Mm-hmm. I just love cabbage. Just I like it raw for coleslaw. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And so if you could only eat at home, like around the holidays, who would cook? Like on Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, like who are the people that would cook? In My grandma now, she could cook. Mm-hmm. My aunts, hot mother, chitlins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Barbecued pig feet. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. That sounds they good. They were good cooks. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so you sound like you you like grew up on good food. From like Yes, but when I was a child, when I was a teenager, when I was younger, I didn't like soul food. Really? Give me a hamburger. I don't want that black people's food. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't like rice, I didn't like grease, I didn't like any of that. any of it. I just didn't really? like it. And so as you got older, you started to develop a love for soul food. Mm-hmm. I just started eating greens in the last 10 years. Oh, wow. I Ten hated years. greens. Wow, what was it about greens that you just you just didn't like? It was weeds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want these weeds. <laughs> the weeds, yeah. But um, as I got older, my girlfriend showed me how to Pick them, mm-hmm. clean them, mm-hmm. cut them mm-hmm. up, yeah. and I developed a taste. I wouldn't eat beans either. So really? I don't want to understand why we have to eat all this poor people food. Oh, you thought it was poor people food. That's interesting. Yeah, I think... I was young. You, I was you a kid. Yeah. I, want, I want a hamburger. Mm-hmm. You just want hamburgers, fries. Yeah, because I didn't like all that stuff. I said, only poor people eat this stuff. I'm mm-hmm. not <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, it's actually it's interesting because as I've gotten... Like, I grew up on soul food, and one of the things I realized... I started to develop a respect for soul food because the roots in slavery mm-hmm. and then taking foods that they were given that they either got the scraps or they had to cook food for like the slave masters and then cook right. food for themselves. Like they really learned how to take some, make something out of nothing. And that's when I really started to fall in love with soul food, not just as the taste of the food, mm-hmm. but just the history behind the food and just how much struggle that went into like the labor of love that went into developing like soul food. Mm-hmm. But I can understand how maybe when you were younger, you like you may not know. Because my mother used to call me the black white girl. Really? She was like, because she don't like black food. I said, no, that's slavery and just poor people food. I'm not eating that stuff. Wow. <clears throat> that's scraps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, we get older. But as like, I got like, older, you know. Grow. Yeah, yeah. And I would not think of eating a chitlin now. Really? Somebody could cook chitlins from that. I eat them seven days a week. Seven days a week. Chitlins. I love chitlins. You love chitlins? I, when I was younger, I used to love chitlins. When I got older, I'm like, I, I don't know if I can eat them anymore. I know a lot of people say it's swine. I said, well, if it wasn't for swine, I would have never made it. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept you. I you love chitlins. Mm-hmm. You got to have somebody that knows how to clean yeah, them think, and know how to cook Yeah, you got to clean them well. Because you yes, clean them even well, if they say they clean, that's not necessary. You got to keep cleaning. You got to keep cleaning. Yeah, my grandma makes chitlins and she cleans. Oh. You got to make sure you, you clean them. Um, yeah, and so I guess I one of the big things that for me is that I love the connection between food and music. And so when you think of good food, what music comes to mind for you? Like, you're at a table and you're having a food. Like, what music do you want playing at your table? Hmm. Anthony Hamilton. Anthony Hamilton. I love He's good. His I voice, love him. His voice is His oh. voice. His voice is. His voice is fabulous. It feels like, so. it sounds like soul food to me. Yes, but he's sounds, southern, you he's know. Southern, it yes. sounds like soul food. Like, if a pot of greens was a voice, Anthony Hamilton's voice is like a pot of good greens to me. Yeah. Yeah. Who else besides Anthony Hamilton? Alicia Keys. Okay. What's your favorite Alicia Keys song? Oh, I don't think I could pinpoint it. I love all her songs. All of them. Just anything she makes. You, mm-hmm. just, you just love. You just love her. And I like, uh, I just recently got into Mill Meek. Real? Really? You like Mill Meek? Or Meek Mill? Yeah, Meek Mill. Meek Mill, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Meek Mill. Meek Mill. I was going to say it's Mill Meek, Meek, Meek Mill. You really? <laughs> Some of his music, he has a song with Mary J. Blige uh-huh. called 911. Yes. I play it all the time. Do you? Mm-hmm. What made you get into Meek Mill? I just happened to hear that song by mistake. Uh-huh. And then I went to look on um, this iPhone I got. Mm-hmm. I went on one of his albums and I'm like, woo, this is not for me. So I changed the song, <laughs> yes. changed the song. And so, ooh, 
I can understand this. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Is he the only rap artist that you look at, listen to? Or is there other rap artists? I heard that somebody you? named Shaggy yesterday. Shaggy. But some of his songs are like, man, you know, we don't need this. <laughs> but a couple of them I like. You like? But other yeah. than that, I don't like rap music. Yeah, you don't like rap music. But Meek Mill. That's your, that's your I like, I guy. understand yeah. where he was coming from. I said, yeah. I can relate to this with my old son. This is cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. So growing up, what was like, what was the music that you loved? Temptations. Temptations. Oh, I love the Temptations. The Shirelles. The Shirelles. I've never heard of the Shirelles. You've never heard of them? I've never heard of the Shirelles. Get out of here. When did they come? Did they come out of Detroit or did they come out of, like, what city did they come I out of? I believe they all came out of Detroit. The Shirelles. I'm going to have to listen because I love old school music. Um, like the Temptations, the, the emotions. The Shirelles. Um, Mary Wells. Mary Wells, yes. You know Mary Wells and don't know the Shirelles? I know Mary Wells. I feel like I know, like, I know the, like, the emotions, the mm -hmm. whispers. Like, uh, I'm like Nina Simone. The Temptations. Like the Temptations. Um, the Four Tops. Um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Now, that's yes. when they were singing. Yes, yes. So he wrote a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of hits. He wrote his own he music, a lot yes. Of, a lot of hits. Yeah. I think to me, like, Soul Food, when I think of Soul Food, I think of that music. Like, I think of them together. Moth and the Bandelts. Yes. Yes, I've heard of them. See, I, I'm from, like, the Metro Detroit area, so I know some, like, a lot of the groups that came out of Detroit, mm -hmm. but I never heard of the Shirelles. I'm gonna have to listen to them. Do you have a song that you remember? I'm just about? trying to think. Mm -hmm. No. No. Well, I have to listen. I have to look it up and listen to them because it. I think it would be good. Mm -hmm. No, I can't think of it. Mm -hmm. I don't even take my carriage. <laughs> Is there a song from the Shirelles that you could sing that you think that people? Are you can, kidding me? You don't. You don't sing it. No. No, you don't. Okay, well, I will make you sing. I will make you sing. Um, oh. Um, I feel good. <laughs> no, we, oh, I forgot. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. No, 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 we can do that. This is relationship foods. We can do all. We can do all of that. But James now, Brown. James yes. Brown will James make Brown. you feel good about eating. Yes, he does. I love James Brown. I love James Brown. Yes, and so I. This has been. I want you to try the, the try the cabbage before yeah. we go. But this has been. This has been so, so good. You like it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I this is my first time. You can make cabbage. cabbage for me anything. <laughs> it's my first cabbage. time making cabbage, guys. I've never made it. Really? Before. My grandma makes really good cabbage, so I kind of like I picked up some hints from her, but this is my mm -hmm. first time like actually making it by this myself. Is good. Oh, thank you. This is very good. Thank you. And it's got a nice crunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to overcook it because you don't want like a mushy, mushy cabbage. I wouldn't have ate it if it was. Mushy. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I know. Mushy I, cabbage that's pink. You don't want. No, it. no, you don't want it. You don't want it. Well, this has been so good. I want to thank you for coming on oh, the show. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, you. Have, this has been so. This has been so good and so life giving for me. So thank you for coming for trying the food. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Remember that is hashtag relationship foods. You can like, share, subscribe, comment. Thank you for all the people who have liked and commented. Keep liking, keep liking, keep sharing, keep subscribing, and I hope you'll tune back in on hashtag relationship foods. See you next week. Bye. Hehehe <laughs>